Good morning and welcome to Persimmon Grove this morning. We are, it's so nice to have you and happy Flag Day. Flag Day, it's on today, uh, just as a reminder for our allegiance to our country and our allegiance to the Christian flag as well. That's why we're here. We're unified in spirit uh, to worship our Lord and Savior. And let's do that. Let's stand together and sing a few verses of Stepping in the Light as we begin our worship this morning. Once again, welcome to our service here at Persimmon Grove. Uh, if you're visiting with us or you're tuning in at home, uh, we're glad to have you. I'm going to go over the bulletin real briefly. Um, first of all, I want to announce that next week, Sunday school starts. Teachers have been on vacation for several weeks. They're anxious to go back, I'm sure. So next week at 930. So remember, it's been... It's been a while, so uh, that 10.30 time slips up on me pretty quick. So uh, just remember, 9.30 next week, Sunday school. Uh, we're even going to have coffee. You're going to have to make it yourself, but that will all be available back in the fellowship hall. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to go over our bulletin briefly before we go to prayers and uh, praises. Uh, just once again, Operation Christmas Child, we're uh, really behind, but we're in a catch-up mode here. And the bulletin has everything listed what we need for the months of April, May, and June. And let's see, um, I think that's pretty well it, unless there's something missing. Does anybody have anything that didn't make the bulletin, or you want to say anything? If not, how about prayer and uh, praises? I know Margaret uh, is having a pretty good report this morning, and she's had a tough time. So let's keep her, the doctors, and in, in in our prayers as they uh, treat her. Yeah, Mother. Remember them in our prayers. Anybody else have any praises or prayer? All right. Good job, Eric. Anybody else? We're glad to have Ben, Brother Ben, with us to finish up his series here. Even though it was brief, we're glad to have you. Uh, Brother Jeremy will be back next week taking this role on, which I'm very okay with. So <laughs> be glad to have him back. So uh, they had a I've, I've touched base with him a couple times when, uh, since they've been gone, and they're having a great time. Uh, weather's great, and uh, so uh, we're glad to have them back. So anybody else have anything before we go to prayer? Yes. I just want to thank everybody for praying for my uh, friend, husband, Mark, um, and his sister, Jane. They're, they're praying for him, uh, and today we received a clean letter from the church that went to Jane, and I know she's going to be praying for him. Up, so, uh, 
keep him in our prayers. Good deal. All right, let's keep our country in our prayers, uh, our president. As we uh, get through these times, and uh, hopefully things will get to back to somewhat to normal. So, uh, and we can fill this little building up here. And we got such a pretty little restored building here. We need to we need to fill it up, and that that's coming. That's coming down the road. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Father. Lord, just what a great day you've given us to assemble here in this little building, Father. We know that we're the church, dear Lord, but uh, Lord, you've blessed us with a, a great little place here to, to come and worship you. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you. We just lift our country up, dear Lord. Just pray for some of the things that are happening, Lord. We pray changes could be made. And Lord, we just thank you most of all for Jesus. Just pray for Brother Ben as he brings us a message here in a little bit dear lord we just pray that you'd speak to him what's laid upon his heart and just thank you thank you for the opportunity thank you for health most of all and uh, lord we just lift the ones up that are struggling right now father we just pray uh, your watch care over them and and lord we know things can turn in in seconds uh, father with you so we just praise you and thank you and look to you for all our answers so be with us as we continue this service in jesus precious name amen Let's stand together for our next hymn and sing a few verses of Oh How I Love Jesus. Brother Ben Wilson told us a message about how Jesus' spirit went out to someone and just and that had faith to heal her. He was a way maker, and by that he needed her faith for his spirit to work. I found another example in Acts 14:9 where Jesus or where a crippled person was healed just because of their faith. And the scripture says, um, while we were at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet. He had been that way from birth, so he had never walked. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached. Looking straight at him, Paul realized that he had faith to be healed. So Paul called to him in a loud voice and said, stand up. And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. That's an example of a physical healing. But yet the same applies for our spiritual needs where Jesus needs your faith for his spirit to work to make a way for you. And if you just flip over one chapter to Acts 15, verse 9, um, Peter, again, is out, and he said, God knows people's hearts, and he has confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them their Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for they for he cleansed their hearts through faith. And thank God he did, because now we can all be spiritually saved. So, and that's the way he made for us. Clark, will you pray?
Grandeur earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice And the seas that are shattered and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard Far be it for me to not believe Even when my eyes can see In this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea And through it all, through it all My eyes are on you through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well. It is well. So let go, my soul, and trust in Him. The waves and wind, they know.
Wow, thank you, Melissa. That was that song is a, such a special song to me. It has ministered to me in some very tough times. Um, good morning. Uh, it is a privilege and an honor to be back with you again this morning. For those of you who weren't able to join us last week or maybe join us online, my name is Ben Wilson, and I am uh, Pastor Jeremy's slightly less attractive friend. Um, and uh, uh, Pastor Jeremy, uh, he invited me to fill in a couple Sundays while he and his family are away getting some rest, and, uh, and I know that he is very much looking forward to being back with you next Sunday for Father's Day. Uh, but last week, we began a two-part series called Waymaker, Waymaker, and uh, we saw how Jesus and his disciples were on their way to a man named Jairus' house. Uh, something happened along the way that caused them to stop. There was this woman there who was bleeding for, she had been bleeding for 12 years. 12 years she had had this. The doctors couldn't help her. In fact, they tried all kinds of treatments and it just made her worse. She was in financial ruin as she had spent all her money that she had on the doctors. And not only that, she was a social outcast, a woman who was spiritually unclean, who could not be around people, let alone have any physical contact whatsoever. But Jesus is about to pass by. Jesus is about to come by her, and she believes that if she can just touch his robe, if she can just touch the hem of his garment, then she will be made well. And so she does. And immediately she is healed. Jesus knows that power has gone out from him, and so he stops. He stops in his tracks and looks for her. We said last week that his power is activated by faith. Everybody is pressing against him. Everybody is touching him. But this woman's touch was different. She believed that Jesus could do for her what no one else could. She believed that Jesus could do what she could not do herself, nor could any of the doctors. Nobody could help her. But Jesus can. Jesus shows his love and compassion for this woman, this one nobody in a sea of somebodies. He stops in the crowd to seek out this one woman, and she falls at his feet, and she tells him the whole truth, it says. Jesus says, daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed from your affliction. See, at the feet of Jesus, this woman finds hope and healing. At the feet of Jesus, Jesus made a way when there was no way. He provides hope when there is none. He helps this woman when no one would, and he does what no one could. With Jesus, the impossible becomes possible. So if you have your Bible with you today, and I hope you do, I ask that you turn with me again to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Just like last week, we're going to begin in Mark, chapter 5, verse 21. But this time, we're going to read all the way to the end. We're going to read all the way to the end. So Mark 5, 21, all the way to verse 43. Please follow along as I read the word of God aloud. When Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the sea. One of the synagogue leaders, named Jairus, came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, My little daughter is dying. Come and lay your hands on her so that she can get well and live. So Jesus went with him. And a large crowd was following and pressing against him. Now a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. Having heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothing. For she said, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be made well. 
Instantly, her flow of blood ceased, and she sensed in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing against you, and yet you say, Who touched me? But he was looking around to see who had done this. The woman, with fear and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed from your affliction. While he was still speaking, people came from the synagogue leader's house and said, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? When Jesus overheard what was said, he told the synagogue leader, don't be afraid, only believe. He did not let anyone accompany him except Peter, James, and John, James' brother. They came to the leader's house and he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him. But he put them all outside. He took the child's father, mother, and those who were with him and entered the place where the child was. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk. She was 12 years old. At this, they were utterly astounded. Then he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Thanks be to God for his word. If any of you have children, you can probably relate at some level. Jairus' daughter is sick. In fact, she's not just sick, she is deathly ill. And Jairus is desperate. He's desperate, he's frantic. He is completely unable to help her. She's 12. But this is his baby girl. I'm sure that they've tried the traditional remedies. It hasn't helped. If Jairus doesn't act quickly, she will die. But what can he do? In a frenzy, he runs out of the house and he runs down to the sea. He has heard, he has heard that Jesus and his disciples, that they are, they've just made the shore and there's a large crowd gathered around. And so he runs to Jesus and he throws himself at Jesus' feet. It doesn't matter anymore that Jairus is the head of the synagogue. It doesn't seem to matter that Jesus is this homeless rebel and Jairus is one of the most well-respected men in the community. It doesn't seem to matter that Jesus has this pattern of ruffling feathers and getting under the skin of Jairus' friends in the religious community. Jairus knows Jesus is his only hope. And so Jairus runs to Jesus. He throws himself at his feet and begs for mercy. Forget about pride. Forget about dignity. In a pile of sweat and tears and snot, the out-of-breath Jairus, he pleads, the father pleads for the life of his daughter. Jairus asks Jesus to come lay his hands on her. Jesus, if you could just come, if you could put your hands on her, then she will get well. Jesus agrees, and they set out, except there's people everywhere. Move! Why won't you just get out of the way? Get out of the way, people. Move. This is an emergency. Jairus' thoughts are screaming in his head, but they are drowned out by the noise of the foot traffic. Then Jesus does the unthinkable. You just wish he would part the people just like the Red Sea. 
But he does and he stops. He stops. Come on, Jesus, we're in a hurry. We got to go. Jesus could have ignored this woman. But he, he didn't. And every second feels like an eternity. Jesus looks on, or Jairus looks on as Jesus heals this woman. She's been suffering for 12 years. 12 years, the same age as his daughter. Jairus sees how this woman who was unclean, how she touches Jesus, the rabbi. And the woman is made clean by Jesus. It's not the other way around. Jesus is not unclean. Jairus hears how this woman, who was a lonely outcast, is called daughter. Jairus witnesses how this woman, who had been in despair and without hope, is sent away with peace and hope and joy from what Jesus did for her. But what was incredible and awesome for this woman turns to complete agony and anguish for Jairus. Verse 35 says, while he was still speaking, while Jesus was still speaking with this woman, people came from the synagogue leader's house and said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Why don't you just leave the teacher alone? She's dead. Look at the contrast between those verses. Verse 34 and 35. In verse 34, Jesus calls a woman daughter and tells her that her faith has saved her. In verse 35, Jairus' daughter is dead. She was not saved. They were too late. Why, Jesus? Why didn't you just ignore this woman? You knew that it was a race against the clock. Why didn't you get there sooner? The first thing we need to see today is this. God's timing is an expression of his love. God's timing is an expression of God's love. If you are Jairus, how are you supposed to feel? Forgotten? Neglected? Rejected? Jesus stopped when he was supposed to be coming with me. He said he would come and he didn't. He said he would help and he didn't. Instead, he stops and he helps this woman. This woman got what she wanted. Why didn't I get what I wanted? She gets healed. Why didn't I get that? Why didn't my daughter get healed? Why does everyone else seem to get blessed and I don't? It always seems to work out for everybody else. Does any of that sound familiar? In her best-selling book, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way, Lisa Turkhurst, she says, When his timing seems questionable, his lack of intervention seems hurtful, and his promises seem doubtful, I get afraid. I get confused and left alone with those feelings. I can't help but feel disappointed that God isn't doing what I assume a good God should do. I want to assume that God would have seen it coming my way and stopped me. Or better yet, I want to assume God would have intervened and prevented this whole thing from happening in the first place. I want to assume that his promise to never leave me or forsake me means that he's operating like a supernatural shield around me, preventing horrific things from happening to me and those I love. Can anybody relate to that? I know I can. But what if it's not the timing that's the problem? but rather our understanding of the situation? What if it's not a matter of God's inaction, but rather a matter of us not looking in the right place? What if we could see the whole picture and understand all possible scenarios and completely grasp the complexity and nuances of the situation? We'd be God. As Pastor Tim Keller says, if we knew what God knows, 
we would ask exactly for what God gives. So why did Jesus delay getting to Jairus' daughter? Perhaps he knew it would be better for Jairus. The best thing for Jairus on that day, in that moment, was that Jesus wouldn't come heal his daughter. At least not right away. God's timing is an expression of his love because he desires what is best for Jairus and what is best for Jairus' daughter and what's best for everybody else who would ever come to hear or know of this story. God's timing is perfect. One of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite lines is, God is rarely early, but he is never late. God is rarely early, but he is never late. Jesus is not a second late. There is purpose in everything that he does. He arrives just when the time is right. His love causes him not to arrive a second sooner and certainly not a second too late. His love causes him to delay. Do you remember the story of Lazarus? Obviously, this would happen after this story here. But in John chapter 11, Mary and Martha send word to Jesus about their brother Lazarus, saying, Lord, the one you love is sick. Lord, the one you love is sick. And it says, when Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. The next verse, now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. What a great verse. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. He loved them so much that he didn't go right away. After two days go by, Jesus tells his disciple, his disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm on my way to wake him up. Then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will get well. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death, but they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. See, one scholar says it this way. He says, delays are not due to our Lord's lack of concern for us. For he is sensitive to the most insignificant needs, such as a meal. It is the purpose of God that these delays will result in greater glory for himself and greater faith for us. Let me say that one more time. It is the purpose of God that these delays will result in greater glory for himself and greater faith for us. See, there are times in our lives when God doesn't change our circumstances. No matter how many times we ask, he doesn't change our circumstances or he doesn't change them the way that we would like him to. There are times where we say, why won't you just take this away, Lord? Just take it away from me. And the fact is, is that he loves us too much to give us anything less than his best. He loves us too much to give us anything less than his best. He can do what we ask. He can give us exactly what we want. Then he wouldn't be a good father. As your children ask for things, do you give them everything they want? No, because you love them. He can make, God can make all of our problems go away. And then when the next situation arises, when there's dire circumstances, we will be right back in the same boat that we were in the first place. When we're in way of our head, we are right back where we were. We're going to feel the same things we felt. We're going to go through the same things. And God doesn't want that for you and me. He doesn't want us to live lives paralyzed by fear, shackled with worry, and plagued with anxiety. 
He loves you and me too much for that. See, fear causes us to question the character of God. Fear tells us that Jesus doesn't care. Fear says, he doesn't really care about you and me. If he did, he would fix it. But the truth is, he cares a great deal. He cares about what is happening inside of us. He cares about your heart, and he cares about my heart. And so he will allow what is ever going on around us, he will allow those circumstances that we do not like, that feel uncomfortable, that hurt us, that actually cause us pain, he will allow those things to change our insides. See, in sharing her own struggles, Lisa Turkers, she has this realization where she had questioned God about the pain that she felt. She says, I had wondered how God could let me be in so much pain. And I had cried because I thought God somehow didn't care about my pain. But in the end, it was the pain that God used to save my life. I now have a completely different picture of God standing beside my hospital bed while I was hurting and begging him to help me. He wasn't ignoring me. No, I believe it took every bit of holy restraint within him to not step in and remove my pain. He loved me too much to do the very thing I was begging him to do. He knew things I didn't know. He saw a bigger picture I couldn't see. His mercy was too great. His love was too deep. See, God's timing is an expression of his love. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Do you know that today? Better yet, do you believe that today? It is for your good, it is for my good and his glory that all things, they happen in a way that they do, in the manner that they do, and yes, even when they do. God's timing is an expression of his love. If we're going to trust God, then we're going to have to trust his timing. God loves me too much to answer my prayers at any other time than the right time, and in any other way than the right way. We have to choose faith. The second thing I want us to see today is this. We have to choose faith. Faith is a choice that we must make. See, Jairus, he's just been told that his daughter's dead. Verse 36 says, When Jesus overheard what was said, he told the, syn uh, he told the synagogue leader, Don't be afraid. Only believe. Don't be afraid. Only believe. See, Jairus, and we have to assume his whole household, had faith in what Jesus could do. They believed that Jesus could heal a sick girl, but a dead girl, not so much. Not so much. As long as she's sick, there is hope. But once she's dead... Out of luck. There is something final about death that I think we all feel. It's one thing to pray for your child's healing from a life threatening disease, it's another thing altogether to stand over her cold, dead body and look for an immediate resurrection. Jairus would have had faith to come to Jesus in the first place. He would have had faith to ask Jesus to heal his daughter. But when he hears of his daughter's death, his faith would have completely crumbled. He would have been devastated. He wouldn't have just been on the ledge. This would have pushed him right over the cliff if he hadn't seen what he just saw. If he hadn't just witnessed what he just witnessed, that might have had a re <laughs> this might have really ended him. But Jesus, he overhears what is said to Jairus, and he turns to him, he, he tells him to drive out fear. Don't worry, Jairus, don't be afraid. Don't be overcome with fear. Have faith. Believe that it will happen, Jairus. See, faith and fear. 
They are mutually exclusive. They cannot coexist. They can't habitate the same place. When faith is great, fears are small. And vice versa. There is an inverse relationship to them. They are incompatible. They can't occupy that same space. And so Jairus, uh, he hears Jesus tell him, have faith that Jesus can make it right. Have faith. See, Jairus might have been feeling afraid in that moment. He might have had fear. He might have been convinced that there was no hope for him. I know that we have fear all the time. It says, man, there's no hope for me. There's nothing that God can do about my circumstances. What can be done? But the fact is that our God can do everything. He can do everything. He does it well. He is our rescuer. He is our refuge. He is our strength. He is our shelter. He is our ever-present help at our time of need. And he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And so we trust him. We don't trust our own abilities. We don't trust the abilities of others. We don't trust whatever else. We trust him. We believe in him. We have faith in him that he can make it right. And so faith has to be an active choice. Faith has to be an active choice. Anything else is to allow fear to take over our lives, to take control. I mean, unfortunately for us, unfortunately, faith is something that is most often forged in fire. Faith is most often forged in fire. There's no easy way around it. It is the pain. It is the hurt. It's the suffering, the doubts, the worries, the cares that not only test our faith, but reveal what faith is there. And as we look back on those trials, as we look back on what happened, as you look back on where you have come from, as you look back on what God has done, it's those very experiences that grow and expand our faith. Because we have had experiences where God has shown himself to be faithful, then we can have faith in him and trust him that all of this, that all of this, whatever is happening in my life, whatever is happening in your life, is for our good and for his glory. See, we always have a choice. We can choose whether to respond in faith or in fear. We can choose to push fear aside and let faith occupy that ground. We can say, my heart belongs to Jesus. My allegiance is to him alone. I trust him that he is working all things for my good and for his glory. Fear, you are not welcome here. You have no place in my life. Or... You can buy into what fear says. You can buy into what it's selling. Maybe this will end terribly. Perhaps God really doesn't care. This, this it could be my demise. It's my undoing here. Perhaps God isn't as powerful as I thought. Maybe he can't do anything at all. Maybe he's distant or uninvolved or indifferent. And we can allow fear to run rampant and think the worst in every scenario. And unfortunately, I think we all know what that looks like. We've been down that road. Faith keeps the focus on God. Where fear takes what rightfully belongs to God. Our focus, our attention, our energy, our strength. And puts it on a set of problems, on a set of circumstances. Jairus tells Jesus... Sorry, Jesus tells Jairus to keep having faith. Keep on, Jairus. Keep on trusting that God is good. Keep on believing that he can do the impossible. Don't give in to your fear. Choose to have faith. And so we pick up in verse 38. It says, they came to the leader's house. And he saw a commotion. People Weeping and wailing loudly, he went in and said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, but he put them all outside. The last thing we need to see today is this. 
there is always hope with God. Where there is God, there is hope. See, when they arrived, they find this interesting situation that's happening here. They find that the funeral uh, process, that the mourning process has already begun. It's already underway. There are mourners there, and they are, they're, they're weeping and wailing. They're wailing, they're crying, they're all the things. There are flute, pay, flute players there. They're already playing their sad tunes. See, the Jewish mourning customs, they were vivid and detailed and very specific, right? They were, they were designed to, uh, to stress the, uh, the final separation of death. These customs, they required even the poorest of the poor to have at least one mourner and two flute players. These, these people, they, they were professional mourners. The mourners would show up as soon as the death was announced, and they would begin to wail, to cry, to scream, calling attention to the fact that death has invaded this home. And so they're kind of hanging out inside, they're hanging out outside, I mean, just weeping, wailing, all the noise, all the stuff. And in comparison to our funeral uh, customs of today, the Jewish funeral customs at this time would have been ridiculously fast. See, the death and burial, they were usually a same-day affair, usually within 24 hours. That's why you see uh, Jesus dying on the cross and being buried the same day. He's put in the tomb the same day, okay? So these professional mourners, they're, they're ready. They, they're ready to get the call. They pick up the phone, or no phone, okay, but, but they're, they're ready, all right? They, they get the, 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 the bat signal. I don't know what happens, but there's a, there's a signal, and, and this girl, she's going to be buried. She's going to be buried soon. And so Jesus, Jairus, and the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, they basically interrupt a funeral. They show up, and they're interrupting a funeral. It's happening. And since Jairus is this wealthy, well-known guy, there are probably many mourners that are present at his home. Mark describes their noise as commotion. Commotion. This word in the Greek describes a clamorous uproar. This is not what hope sounds like. Weeping and wailing. One can only imagine what this looked like or what it sounded like to Jesus. Probably clanging pots and pans. This isn't what he had in mind when he spoke the universe into existence. This wasn't supposed to be part of the plan. Death, mourning, weeping, wailing. I would imagine that Jesus has a fresh wave of emotion come over him. Compassion is welling up in him for people who are grieving like this. And at the same time, there is anger towards death for causing this kind of pain. Fury towards sin that would even bring this kind of suffering into the world. And so Jesus, he marches into the house and he's like, what? in the world is going on here why are you weeping and wailing like this this child isn't dead she's only asleep now Jesus knows Jairus' daughter's dead Jairus knows she's dead the disciples know she's dead everybody at the house knows that she is dead but what they don't know is that Jesus is about to wake this girl up just like she was taking a nap Jesus is about to make her alive, perhaps more alive than she has ever been in her life. He uses this word asleep because dead is not how she's going to stay. Dead is not going to be her permanent state. Her death is only temporary. Death has no claim on this girl because Jesus is present and where God is, there is always hope. It says in verse 40 that they laughed at him. The mourners, they laugh at him. They mock Jesus. They ridicule him. They knew death when they saw it, but faith is believing what we cannot see. We walk by faith and not by sight. And if these people, if they had faith, they would know that who, the person who is standing in their midst they would know what he is capable of. That if they truly had faith, they would not be responding like this. 
all of the weeping and all of the wailing. Friends, this is not how believers react. This is the opposite. This is the opposite of that. In 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 13, he says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Obviously, as we read Mark chapter 5, Jesus has not died and rose again at this point in time. But I think he is grieved by their grieving. I think he's a little put off by these professional mourners. And so he just busts into the funeral. He's like, I am the authority on life and death. I am the guy who spoke and life is created. I am the author of life. I am the one who says what is dead and what is alive. Now, what are you crying about? Knock it off. Verse 40 says, he put them outside. That is a very nice way of saying he kicked them out of the house. He ran them out. Get out of here. And it says that he takes the child's mother and father and his three disciples, those who were with him, he enters the place where the child was. He takes the child by the hand. Her arm, her hand is limp. Maybe it's cold by this point. And he says, Talitha Kum, little girl, get up. When Peter is telling this story to Mark, and Mark's writing it down, I'm sure those words are still ringing in Peter's ears. It's so beautiful. Mark, he doesn't even put it into Greek. No translation will do it justice. He leaves it right there in the original Aramaic. Talitha. Talitha, this term of endearment. It's like saying honey or sweetheart. It can also be translated as lamb. As the good shepherd is gathering up this little lamb. And in that moment, and so many moments afterwards, what was dead is made alive. The dead rise. Little girl, get up. And she gets up and she starts walking around. Do not forget, my friends. Do not forget what our God is capable of. As it says in a popular worship song, Oh, my soul, remember who you are talking to. The only one who death bows to, that's the God who walks with you. Jesus not only brings hope in the midst of despair, he brings life in the midst of death. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Where there is life, there is hope. He is life. And where there is God, there is hope. Jesus gets the last word, and he says, it's not the end yet. See, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of whatever situation you are in, if you are in Christ Jesus, your story will not end in sadness. Your story will not end in despair. If that's where you are today, then know that God is not finished with you yet. You may experience pain, sorrow, grief, mourning for a time, but our God is the one who has victory over death. Our Savior has overcome the grave. We have hope because there is an empty tomb that once held a body. We have faith that the faithful one is greater than anything we can ever face. He is the only one who has the power to save you and me. We can trust him no matter what. Death does not have the final say. Jesus does. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you. We thank you for this incredible truth 
God, that you are greater than anything in us or around us. God, you are greater than our sin. God, we thank you that you are far quicker to forgive than we are to repent. God, we thank you that your ability to save is far greater than our ability to sin. God, thank you that you rescue sinners. God, help us to have faith. Help us to believe that you can do anything. You are the one who makes the impossible possible. God, help us to trust in you during those hard times, during those difficult times. Help us not to worry. Help us to believe your promises. God, we know you love us. Help us to believe that. We know that you care about us. Help us to remember that. God, may you be glorified in us, in our trials, in our circumstances. May you receive greater glory from my life. Would you receive greater glory from my friends' lives? You are good and worthy to be praised. So God, we seek to praise you in every circumstance. We rejoice with every day for every good and perfect gift comes from you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. continue to 